juggler, you take me for jokes. Live in the basement, church pews and funeral faces. Cardio your bracelets for my women friends. I'm in Vegas. Who the fuck y'all thought it's supposed to be? And Phil Jackson came back, still no coaching me. I'm Let's talk about this track. What, how, how did this come about? Where did, where did you make this track? Uh, let's see. Uh, it was actually towards the end of um, the artist Big Sean's album. Um, one of the things, um, I guess, where I could start, where I would like to start off relating to good products is that um, I'm a big you know, proponent of sound. As, as technology advances, um, you know, technology makes a lot of us you know, able to make a lot of different melodies, a lot of different rhythms. You know, previously, you know, only humans could create, but now, you know, there's so much technology that creates music that um, I believe that whoever can create a sound that um, sounds better than, than the next person, that, that's where we're kind of headed. So, um, working on his project, I kind of felt like he needed something dark, gritty, organic, old sounding just to uh, bridge into a different market as opposed to the commercial um, electronic glossy. spear glossy sound. So that was the, the purpose of the creation of the song. And it was really designed just to, you know, attract a different market um, into his rollout. I, I think that's great. I just love the way this track sounds because he has its own color that I haven't heard for this kind of uh, rhyming. I really like the, the combination of the two. So you did this in Ableton Live, right, originally? Yes. And so how does the uh, the UAD and the Universal Audio stuff come into your workflow? How do you use it? Well, you, you said the word is color. So um, I also believe that as a producer, um, it's up to us to bring a color to the sound before it gets to the engineer in the next stage. It's really not for the engineer to color your music. It's really for them to uh, kind of finish off in level loss, but, but we should be in control of the color of the sound. So that is, to me, part of the production process. Uh -huh. um, so usually first is, is writing melodies, and then for me it's color the sounds, and that's what a UAD so how so? Which are your go-to plugins? Which do you like best? Well, on here we have um, a whole two, bunch of Studer. Two of my favorites, which are the Studers. Um, I would say just being a, a student of how old music was created, um, I kind of went back and realized all the stages that old music used to go through by default of lack of technology. So you had a organ or, uh, or drums and they had to go through a mic and they had to be processed by that mic, go to that board, to that tape. That tape had to play that back through that board to mix it and you go back. So all of these different stages color music by default in the past. Um, so what I create after I kind of got a good idea of what I want to do, I immediately go to imitate the stages of, you know, old music that I kind of study, emulated. And there's so many different choices. So in this one, um, I have the Studer. And the way they have it, <coughs> you can put the gain controls on. I don't know if everybody knows that, but once you put the gain control, Yep. On the studer, every studer is now controlled by one. So it's almost like having all your tape machines um, synced. Synced. Yep. So I usually let the music get there, and then I begin to toy with the um, input because I'm looking for saturation or, um, or you know the imitation of what saturation would be like because um, to get certain sounds, you want to come into a machine hot back in the day and maybe turn down the output. So that, that's usually my first um, step of coloring is just 
allowing a tape machine to begin to color it through uh, either high input or low input with hiss and hum to just find a place where I can either get a warmth or uh, a feeling, uh, a noise, something that can give my sound a, a distinct sound. Which is interesting because a lot of people are looking at equipment and say, oh, how clean is it? Um, how much dynamic range does it have? Uh, you know, how amazing does it sound? And that's that's great. But what's going on here is no ID is actually using very very clean equipment, but he's using the plugins to create a vibe by using a, a range of fill and just getting into it and saturating it. Maybe we should listen to say if we listen to the organ the way it is right now. Second, so I don't kill you because we love you, we don't want to kill you. If we bypass these two things, the organ, there's also a milk filter. You want to talk about the milk filter? Yes, so the milk filter, um, in studying, I you know, I also studied like the history of all the keyboards that were you know created. And I kind of just did a timeline of you know how I like the way music sounds pre keyboards and then the introduction of electronic music um, and a lot of the limitations again were, were causing a sound. So when I saw the Moon filter in the uh, UAD set, I immediately said, okay, I want to treat sounds the way I would treat them if I was using a Moon keyboard, which again goes into um, <coughs> The fact that the filters have a certain feeling that it creates when you turn the volume up again or you um, filter some of the high end out, it kind of gives it a warm place because a lot of this, again, we'll, we'll expect the engineer to know how we want it to go, but the truth is we, we should know and we should place our sounds where we want to place them so that it's very clear what our intention with the sound is really So let's see what it does. I mean, this is the sound raw, with none of the book and none of the, just the organ, with none of the book and none of the tutor. Very bland to me. Yeah, it's a little um, bland. Yeah. Okay. So then you turn on the book, and it's probably going to give some gain in a second. in the red, but really, I like to bring sounds, sounds down. Maybe turn them up on the input stage and then turn them down and leave space for the engineer at the end of the day to do a dynamic mix. This is a good use of the, of the boogie. In this case, you're really using it to give grit. It's very nice. And then you turn the studer on, it sounds like this. So all of it is subtle, but it's, it's EQing and compressing and um, characterizing your sound and coloring it um, without expecting someone to know, you know, how to take an EQ or, you know, waves plugging in or, you know, your typical things that, that most engineers learn today. You know, and, and most of us don't really talk like the uh, high end communication of a language with engineers, you know, they say, I need my kick to, you know, need it a little more, and you know, that, that's kind of like an illiterate conversation. I mean, you really could say, hey, it needs this amount of uh, compression from that specific compressor, because that specific compressor has this specific um, sound. sound or characteristic, but it, it, it all comes in a lot of study, and, you know, 
these plugins to me are like far ahead of what everybody is using them for. It's really emulated a lot of old great things that we just haven't figured out how they were used by default to create the sound of some of our favorite records in the past. That's a great way to put it. So do you, do you use um, Apollo? Because we've been talking about the plugins, um, and but for the last two years, Universal Audio has released this this box, this web rack you that pretty much has everything. Do you have the Apollo? A few. A few? <laughs> what do you mean a few? A few. I don't know anybody who has more Apollos than me. How many do you have? Three. Two. Okay, well we even. Okay, fair enough. Actually with this one I have four. But I have two seven. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right, so what do you use your Apollos for? I mean, you have access to whatever you want, so why do you choose Apollo? Um, that's a, I have one, well, in, in my studio, I have my console. I have a lot of, of the real equipment as well. So I'm always ABing um, plugins to real equipment um, to see um, the difference. Um, where things automatically happen when we just run a sound through um, a piece of equipment. So I have a small desk to the side of all of the studio things, which is kind of like my work desk. And I have Apollo there, which runs into my console. Which, so it's like the Pro Tools rig and the studio and the live room. And we kind of do a lot of live cutting there, but then I'm kind of here quarterbacking from Apollo um, because it just gives me a little more control as a creator um, versus um, the things that I would use in post-production and mix. Yeah, it's a it's a carving tool. It's not a finishing tool in the way you use it. You yes. can do it all, but you, uh, do you use the real-time plugins on the way in? So do you process your audio on the way in? Um, not as much because I'm kind of old school. Um, which is not to commit, but I do use the um, save the settings. Yep. So I was um, usually get an idea of what I want to do, but I'll, I'll record the, the clean signal and save the setting, and then I can always recall. What, what no, idea is, no idea is talking about is that you can actually take a snapshot of the UAD console that looks like this. That's the console, right? This console represents every input on your Apollo track. And so, he can save the settings of everything and then recall them later. So for example, he could say, I like the sound, save the setting, record the sound clean. But he can go back later and say, oh, I like that sound, what was it? He recalls the settings and he can apply it, post, which is a very smart way to do it. That way you don't have to commit to the ultra distorted organ. You don't know what it's going to want to be in a few weeks. It's a good way to work. So the save the session thing is pretty awesome. Yeah. Very good. Um, so how, how did uh, Big Sean check to this? Uh, Neo Vintage Tone. Uh, he liked it. I mean, he, he kind of sure. knew that he wanted, you know, a neat oh, right. what's okay. missing. Man. So you didn't impose it on him? No. Okay, good. Great. Well, I think it's a great sound for him. And uh, it's actually doing great things for hip hop because it's making people hear hip hop in a different way. And, uh, and not as glossy and, and I don't know how to explain it. Bland. I really like what you've done with this. It's great. Does anybody have questions? Can you come closer because it's incredibly loud in here. First question. First question. What was the uh, sample in there that wasn't able to get clear? What was the sample in there that was not able to get clear? That that's a myth. It was a, never a sample. Really? No, that was just a myth. Oh, Second question. Secondly, like for songs like DOA. It sounds like D.O.A. or the Young State of Mind. Empire State of Mind, yes. Uh, do you use ABC drums or do you use live drum for those kinds of songs? Like this D.O.A. sounds like it's a live, it sounds like a live kick. Yeah. So, that, that would again go to this point that I kind of don't limit my creation stage to one stage. I have what I would consider like a vibe out where I create content that I then create with. So sometimes 
we'll take some drums into the live studio and we'll just play some drums and record them. And we'll run them through some things and we call it record it wrong to get it right. You know, rarely do I try and record things right. You know, it's always an experimentation. So those specific drums are like me record, uh, having some sound source that I created at some whole other time, and then I'll put it into a sampler and then play another pattern with it. But when we created it, we're not thinking about the pattern, we're just thinking about the sound, the sonics. We'll take drums outside, record them, record them with little cassette decks with, you know, we just do weird things to create sound sources. So again, that's like a separate process to me other than create songwriting. The songwriting process is different than the producing process for me. And you know, I really try to break it down into these stages because I believe there's so much loss in the way we have just so much access with technology to do everything right now. And it's like, you can't think of everything to do to something right now. You know, maybe the Beatles could sit there and play their song, but it was so many things happening in that room with that technology, the lack of technology that created that sound that we just can't make it happen today. But really, if we back trace, you know, the steps, we'll figure out how and why it happened. So I kind of separate my steps. Um, and I kind of have things sit there and then I take them and create more and until they meet a song and an artist. And then I'll finish the song. Great. Very interesting process. Someone else has a question? Yes. We, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah. He asked, do I believe in using SP-1200s and MPCs? Um, Beatboxes? Yeah, sampling, drum machines. Not as much, mainly because I have actually figured out all the reasons those machines sound the way they are. Because at the end of the day, they're still computers. And you just have converters and computers. So, again, sometimes we rely on a machine as if the machine um, is doing something, but it's really just how many hertz is that sample? How many, what's the bit rate of that sample? What's the, ga the, the gain um, in? What happens when you peak the gain in? How much does it cut off the high end? You know, it's like, once you figure that out and then you can emulate it properly, you don't need, I, I hear a lot of people use how does this DAW sound? How does that program sound? It's, it's just, we just got to make the sound the way we want to make it sound. We're supposed to control the sound. So I don't let the machines control my perspective of how I want my sound to sound. So I don't rely on it. Maybe if I just want to feel the feeling of that machine, then I'll use it as an instrument, but not to get that sound that those machines traditionally gave us. That's the purpose of heading into the plugins and, and the different adjustments of the sound that you create. You can really, I mean, you know, you can make it sound the way you want once you get a higher understanding of how it, and why it sounds the way it sounds. You can also spend a lot of money chasing the sound that you can get very simply with a couple plugins in the box. <laughs> yeah. Not me, of course, nobody in this room, right? Nobody in this room would do that. Uh, any other questions? Yes, stream so I can hear you. Yes, he said, what are the techniques I use today? Um, something similar that I use working with Kanye West. Yes. Again, that, you know, part of that magic is not just the melody, it's not just the performance, it's a, it's a subtle sound that resonates, you know, sound is vibration. Vibration affects you. Um, how you change that vibration of that sound has a distinct effect on the listener, physically and audio, you know, 
Um, it's really specific. We'll spend we'll spend more time on that than we do trying to create something fun or melodic. You know that that that's just gonna come. We've got great musicians. Some it's a lot of great musicians. It's a lot of people in this whole place. <clears throat> you know, the thing that's gonna probably differentiate people is the sound. And how that sound jumps out the speaker. I, I was saying the speaker never lies. Turn it on, make the people react or they don't. And your goal is to make a sound that causes someone to, you know, pay attention and and concentrate or feel an emotion or you know, um, notice it. So Again, those are some of the techniques, but they're just based on um, experimentation, breaking rules, um, being not being afraid to you know do things wrong again to get it right. Uh, I, I guarantee most of the records that you like in your life that you'll remember something was done improperly by all you know education standards. You know, it's not Thriller sounds the way it does, but we can't make an album that sounds as good as Thriller. Um, but Quincy knew a lot, and he had a good team around him. You know, Bruce Swift, who, you know, Bruce. Um, it's just a lot of people, it's just like, we can't do music and, and not study and educate ourselves on the past, regardless of what type of music we try to do. You're just not gonna be successful in anything in life without some form of education and experimentation. So that, that's really, you know, like I could go through every single plug in. You know, sometimes I do it on my own, sometimes I spend a day just going through them. And then sometimes I go get the old equipment and I, and I toy around with it because you never know. And then I look up my favorite records and I figure out, well, they did this record this year. What was available? What wasn't available? What was probably in that studio at that time, according to history? And, you know, it, 20 years plus has rewarded me, you know, to stay, you know, relevant, I guess the word is, and doing music. So, cheers. I think you're rather than this major on the statement. <laughs> Um, that's all we have time for. Like, a big round of applause for Noaidi for coming down and sharing his wisdom with us.